Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Today, we're joined by Sir Richard Eyre, an internationally renowned director, producer, and author who received the 2018 Gilgad Award for Excellence in the Dramatic Arts. He has worked with such stars as Anthony Hopkins, Jeremy Irons, Laura Linney, and Vanessa Redgrave. Until 1997, Sir Richard presided over Britain's National Theatre, and he recorded his reflections in a memoir with the witty title, National Service. His many accolades as a stage director include five Olivier Awards. Meanwhile, he has also enriched our lives with such wonderful films as Iris, starring Judy Dench and Kate Winslet, Notes on a Scandal, starring Kate Blanchett and Judy Dench, Stage Beauty, starring uh, Claire Danes, and The Children Act, starring Emma Thompson and Stanley Tucci. Speaking with Sir Richard today will be John Andrews, a longtime NAC member, and who also heads the Shakespeare Guild. And without further ado, let me pass it over to John. Please enjoy the program. Thank you, Nadine. And welcome, Richard. Hi, good to see you. And, uh, uh, Nadine is arranging a, um, an event today that involves three time zones, Mountain Standard Time, Eastern Standard Time in the US, and Greenwich Mean Time uh, in the UK. So Richard, um, you were telling us uh, a bit earlier that uh, you feel as if you've lost a profession. Could you say a little bit about what COVID has done for your career? Uh, at least at the moment, and, and for Britain in general. Well, John, I had two shows running in the, the West End in, uh, in March. One was a production of Bly Spirit, Noel Coward's Bly Spirit, and the other was a production of Mary Poppins' The Musical. And um, so that uh, my source of income just stopped overnight in the middle of March, so I became unemployed and unpaid. Um, so it's, it's been alarming. I, I made, uh, I was offered a, a, a TV movie in May and then the offer was withdrawn because they said they couldn't insure me because I'm over 70. So um, this, is, this is hard times, but uh, you know, I've I've had it, it. It's not the time of my life. I've had uh, many many years uh, uh, being spoilt with uh, with the work that I've been offered. Um, what the effect on the country has been quite debilitating because the hardest hit sectors are, of course, theatres, uh, perform the performance arts, and hotels and restaurants, the, the hospitality industries. And it's really sapped the, the morale of the country. And we're now, uh, as, as you will know, being subjected to uh, being forced by um, the government to leave the European Union and find our resources depleted, our national income depleted. And in my case, our uh, morale and um, political probity depleted. So uh, it's, it's not great times for us. Um, and it, um, I'm reminded of, of Gloucester's speech in, in uh, King Lear, these late eclipses of the sun and moon uh, uh, that um, bring no good. Uh, and if it's this bad for you, it has to be even worse for actors who are on the margins, who are not normally uh, scheduled several uh, productions in advance and so forth. So it must be very 
discouraging for everyone in the entertainment industry? I think it's uh, very discouraging for uh, for actors and for all freelancers, all the ancillary workers. I mean, you 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 see a show in, this, uh, in a theater and there may be 20 actors on stage, but there'll be another 20 backstage and then there'll be people in the box office, there'll be the ushers, there'll be the, the, the cleaners and uh, the lighting crew and the stage crew. And so it's, it's all those uh, invisible um, professions which are uh, terribly hard hit and they have no resources. You can't, if you're an actor, you can't just invent your performances out of thin air. You need an audience to perform to. And the one thing, I mean, people are looking for salvation in the, in the vaccine, we all are, but uh, we need audiences confidence to be uh, reassured in order for, for audiences to, to return. When we last saw each other, uh, it was in uh, November of uh, 2019. And uh, you were at that point about to open Mary Poppins and you were directing it under the auspices of uh, Cameron McIntosh. I, was it the Prince Edward Theater? I can't remember. Prince Edward Theater, yes. Yes. And, um, and at that time, everything looked wonderful, didn't it? And uh, it, it did look wonderful. And Cameron was opening a, a, a newly restored theater called the, the Sondheim Theater, beautifully restored. Right, and um, you were um, presenting an award to him. And I made a, a speech in his honor, um, praising him for being an extraordinarily magnanimous and, and successful and visionary um, theater owner and producer. And how is his empire going to be? I mean, is he, does he have the resources to, to weather this, this uh, storm or is he in difficulty as well? I think he has the resources. And um, uh, again, what, what of course is uh, not apparent, immediately apparent is that keeping the theaters he has, I think it's eight, theaters and they're they're probably the eight best uh theaters playhouses um in london and um maintaining them when they're not being used is of course a, a costly business you the, yeah. the wear and tear just right. the, the the natural decay of, of buildings i mean you know if you leave a house for a few months and you come back and you find there's always a leak somewhere. There's always a, a short circuit. There's always, you know, leaves and dust and, and water and detritus. And so, so it is with, with theaters, but magnified to, to a large extent. But uh, what is so painful is that all those theaters of his were, were full. There were, you know, Mary Poppins was playing in one, Hamilton was was playing in another, Tom Stoppard's new play was was playing in Wyndham's Theatre, which I think is probably the best playhouse in, in London. So it's it's it has been a, a terrible amputation, and um we have yet to see whether the 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 graft will take. Yes. Are you doing some writing? Is this a good I time? Am right. I have been I've written, in fact, <laughs> sounds preposterous, but I have written two plays since Wonderful. the beginning of lockdown. So since the beginning of May, but they are both plays that I had in mind for years and years. And I never, I always put them on one side because there was always something to go on to. And then it was like being forced into solitary confinement. I had to face um, the ceiling of my own abilities. And uh, it was a really a matter of, of pride to myself that I wrote the plays that I'd had in, in mind. I had to force myself to sit down, I'm going to do it. And of course, once I started, 
um, it just it, it poured out. And then I had I have um, producers for the first of the plays, and they've been very encouraging. And so I'm on, I think, a fourth draft of that play, and they and the 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 most recent one. Um, is uh, is with uh, a producer at the moment, and uh, I'm optimistic for both of them if we get theatres back. Yes, well, I'm sure we will with the vaccine now, and particularly now that we know that William Shakespeare himself has taken one of them. Number number two, <laughs> you, you you certainly couldn't <laughs> or wouldn't make it up that the no. second person to right. receive the vaccine in the whole of the United Kingdom was called a good time, don't you think? Oh, um, John, I have to believe that that's a good omen. If that yeah. isn't a good omen, what is? I agree, I agree. Well, you know, I was watching um, a couple of nights ago, uh, a conversation that you did at uh, the Rose Burford College, is that? Oh, that Rose Burford, yes. 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 And you were talking with Ian McKellen. Yes. And referencing about uh, various things. And it was a wonderful reminder of what a distinguished career you've had, how many things you've done in not only theater, but uh, television, film. I can't think of any director who has a more versatile uh, range uh, has more versatility than you do. It's just extraordinary. And the various people that you have uh, uh, directed and uh, and the prizes you've won and that they have won is uh, remarkable. So I really hope that we now have at least one of your plays to be adding to uh, the uh, the collections. So this is something we can be looking forward to. Well. Thank you, thank you. Um, of course, I hope so. Um, uh, making my, I, I, actually it's not my debut. I wrote a play when I was 25, which was on, and there's an eminent producer, um, still alive called Michael Codron. Um, extreme, he was, Michael Codron was the producer in the 60s, 70s and 80s who put on Pinter's plays, uh, Stoppard's plays, um, uh, all the uh, Joe Orton's plays. He was the, the go-to producer, a uh, wonderful producer. And he brought an option on my play in um, 1967. And it was performed in Hampstead um, and moderately successful. And then I wrote another, and that was going to be presented and I lost my nerve. Um, I just, I, I, um, I said, I don't want this play and it's never been performed. So it's, it is a long, you know, it's 50 years between plays. Um, so I, I, I very much hope that these two plays will be performed next year or the year after. I hope so too. If, if so, we'll be able to say that sweet are the uses of adversity. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and uh, have you been gardening? Uh, you, you mentioned um, that was one of the uh, things you most enjoyed absolutely. doing when you had some time off. I've been gardening, I guess, maybe two hours every day through the summer, um, much longer than that. Um, so I would garden early in the morning, um, maybe three or four hours, then right for the, the rest of the day. And I did that through, we had the most lovely summer and we're lucky enough, I mean, Gloucestershire, which is the sort of heart of, of English countryside, really beautiful um, valleys, hills and, and uh, chalk quarries and uh, it's it's the most magnificent landscape and we have a garden on the side of a hill in fact on, on the site of an old quarry um, and so there's maybe two-thirds of an acre there's quite a lot of garden to to look after um, but my recent obsession 
is uh, just acquired a dog. Um, in, in the last, uh, it, the dog has been with us for two and a half weeks. It's uh, a Labrador cross with a Springer Spaniel, um, an absolutely beautiful dog. She's called Matty and has a very sweet nature. And um, so that's what I'm doing. I spent a lot of time looking after Matty. Yes, I like that. Now, how is Sue? Tell us, uh, and a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, people watching this may not know that Sue Burke Russell, your wife, is herself a prominent uh, filmmaker and director. And uh, how, is, how are things with her? Is... She is very well. Um, she uh, has a project which has been stalled. Um, she, I'm sure that people who are watching this will have watched Cranford, uh, two series of, of Cranford, which she produced, and the, um, the legendary Pride and Prejudice with um, Colin Firth, uh, and the, the emerging from the lake with a wet shirt. Yes. Um, it seems to be the, the thing oh, no. that people remember most vividly <laughs> that um, she had a great success with that and with um, in fact two um, uh, uh, novels, Gaskell novels. She did a, a, a series of Wives and Daughters which is a not very well known um, Mrs. Gaskell novel that I do recommend. I recommend getting her series and if you haven't seen Cranford which has an all-star cast headed by Judy Dench and um, it's you can while away many many happy hours watching all the episodes of, of Cranford. I must do that I haven't I bet my wife has um, she she tends to get these things before I do but um, I, well, do give her my regards by the way. I will do so and she said to give her regards to you as well. Thank you. Well, you mentioned Judy, and um, am I correct that she had something to do with your becoming a director? She did. Um, I became a director when I was an actor, and I was um, performing in a show in Leicester, which is a, a town about 100 miles north of London, on the edge of the, the Midlands. Um, and it was a Christmas show. I was terrible in it and so bad that I thought I can't inflict this any longer on a paying public. And I had a sort of epiphany and um, decided to give up acting. But um, I gathered together some of the actors in the company and asked them if they would let me direct them in a play. The play was called The Knack by Angelico. And so five of them, um, agreed to be in this play and it was presented for a Sunday night production and Judy and her friend John Neville came to see the show on the Sunday night and um, I was then offered a job by uh, John Neville with the encouragement of, of Judy and uh, we became friends after that and the, the guy who was running the theatre said to me, um, he said, do you know you could be a director, you could be an actor, you could be a director, uh, but I think you have to choose. And I thought, how astonishing. Never, no one had ever said to me before that I had a destiny, I had a, I could do anything really. Um, uh, because I studied science and the only thing that I had been told is that I could be a very a successful chemical engineer. Uh, but I knew that my heart wasn't in it. So um, he said to me, you know, I think you should be a director. And then he took me on as his assistant. And that's how I started directing. And that's how I started my friendship with, with Judy. That's wonderful. And uh, was uh, was it in Edinburgh that you first really established yourself in the profession? Yeah, it was. I was in Edinburgh for six six and a half years at the Lyceum Theatre in Edinburgh, 
in between that, I did um, the occasional show in London. Um, but, and then I moved from Edinburgh to Nottingham uh -huh. and became director of the Nottingham Playhouse yes. in 1973 and spent five very, very happy years there. And then I became, then I moved into, into television. Yes. And it was a BBC series of plays, was it not? Am I correct about that? It was a series called Play for Today, which yes. when I describe it, you'll see was an extraordinary antique because um, I joined 78, 79. The brief was I had to, to produce 10 dramas, uh, which were had to be um, 75 minutes long, and they had to be contemporary, and they had to be about um, subjects that had contemporary relevance. So mm -hmm. the brief was effectively to stir up a bit of trouble. Uh, yeah. the, 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 the films, the, the shows went out at 9.25 on Thursdays. And in those days, this was, of course, pre-satellite TV. Uh, the audience was very um, concentrated. So you could often get an audience of five or six million for a quite hard hitting contemporary drama uh, without stars. And that was it was a, a, a thrilling thing to be given that brief to to actually stir up trouble with with an audience, and often there were a lot of complaints, and there was, you know, they used complaints about swearing, complaints about nudity, complaints about politics. Um, but it was it was a very um, heady time to be uh, to be making drama for for television, and the idea now that anybody would ask you to do a piece of contemporary drama and set out to make trouble um, yeah. seems absolutely bizarre. Yeah, I like that. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, uh, an African-American uh, uh, civil rights leader named John Lewis in the United absolutely. States. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and his expression is make good trouble. Make and, good uh, trouble. That's yeah. very good. Yeah. Yes. And so that lasted for what, four or five years? Is that what you were saying? Um, that lasted about, um, oh, four years. Wow. Then I went to, I became an associate director of the National Theatre. And I did a production of Guys and Dolls at the National Theatre, um, which was kind of my calling card. Wow. Um, and it was the first time the National Theatre had done a musical. Wow. There was a huge um, fuss in the press about Britain's National Theatre doing an American musical. A, because the National, it was thought that the National Theatre shouldn't do musicals. B, because it was American. C, because uh, you know, where was I going to be able to to get the cast? And uh, it was sort of thrilling to be to have that challenge. I got so the you cast. Were I got trouble again. Sorry, I was making you were trouble. Making trouble again. Yes. Yeah, but um, I didn't feel it at the time. I just thought we were having such fun, and there was. Um, Julia McKenzie was in it, and Bob Hoskins, and um, Ian Charlson. Uh, it was a it was a sensational cast, and somehow it all came together. And far from being mocked, um, it was a huge success, and in some way was a watershed for the National Theatre because it it warmed up the National Theatre. Here was a, a, an entirely demotic piece of work that everybody loved with British actors playing Americans and and it was a love a love letter to, to Broadway um, and 
it was outpoured, you know, the, the, the hearts of, of everybody involved and the audience who, of course, had all been brought up on, on those musicals. And right. like me, you know, half more than half in love with American culture since I was a child. Did that transfer to the West End? Uh, it did, but on and off it played at the National Theatre for about 10 years. Really? And when I became director in um, 1988, um, and I revived it in uh, 10 years later, um, and it was sort of my farewell to the, the National Theatre, so it, it had another life, that production. Um, with Imelda Staunton uh, starring in it, who had been Julia McKenzie's understudy first time round. So it it did it, it had about a what a twenty um, a kind of twenty year life. Yes, wonderful. That is that's amazing. You've directed a lot of American playwrights, haven't you? I know you've done a, a recent. Uh, um, let's see. I'm trying to think. What was it that I, that you did in uh, in uh, New York a couple of oh, years? Oh, uh, Long Day's Journey. Long Day's Journey and Tonight, O'Neill. Yes. Um, yes, because for my generation, you know, the American playwrights, uh, Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams, um, uh, Eugene O'Neill, were the the writers of the English language dramatists. Who did we have? Um, well, not until 50s, 60s, you know, did writers of, of muscle in the English language start to emerge. So I was I was brought up on those writers and and I've always loved Miller's plays and, and Williams plays, done a lot of of, of them. And uh, that was the first O'Neill that I had directed, but I'd always been fascinated by O'Neill for very, since I was oh, 20, I guess. Yes. And tell us about your 10 years as artistic director of the National. I know you've written about it in National Service, but uh, what, would the, what were yeah. some of the highlights of that time? Well, what I discovered was that the joy of running the National Theatre, and it was a joy. Um, in my memoir called, thank you, Nadine, uh, wittily titled National Service, as Nadine said, um, I describe a lot um, feeling very low, uh, feeling depressed. And that the only reason I do that is because happiness writes white. And if you keep a journal, you don't write, I feel terrific today. What a good day. The sun is shining. I don't have any troubles in the world. Actually, what you do is you write for your journal because writing it down, what your problems are, is a way of, of dealing with it. You, you, you make them concrete. Um, and it's possible then to look back and think, how odd that a week ago I was um, very, very high and now I feel very low. And so it's, I came to realize that um, being a director running a theater is endemically um, manic depressive, that you go up and down. And, you know, that's, that's the nature of, of theater that, um, you know, what goes up come, comes down. Um, so, but the answer I was saying, what I found the most exciting thing was um, whatever the opposite of schadenfreude is, um, and it, it's, it's joy in other people's success, taking joy, that's being a producer, which oh. essentially is what the job of running a national theater is, one, you're a, you're a sort of representing the theater of the nation. So you're, you're a figurehead and spokesperson. Two, you're a director setting a sort of benchmark. And three, you're a, you're a, 
um, bureaucrat come entrepreneur come producer and in many ways that's the most important part because you're you're programming three auditoriums and maybe five shows in each auditorium in a year so a minimum of, of 15 shows a year and so it would be a preposterous vanity to think that you're making the theater solely in your own image what you're doing is establishing um, a, a, a cohort of colleagues who share your tastes and visions or if they don't then you feel that they challenge them in a way that you respect and um, that's the joy of it that you put together a a portfolio of productions you build up a a, a group of of um, writers of, of directors of designers of actors with whom you you feel um some kind of uh collegiate loyalty and admiration and that's and everything grows from that but it it's uh it accrues rather than setting out with a, a sort of monolithic vision and saying i will do this i will do this it's it's pragmatic um it has to be it's empirical and if it isn't then um i don't think any theater in the world has ever functioned on uh, a, um, a non-pragmatic a non-empirical um process i mean even you might say the berliner ensemble Bertolt Brecht's um, theater. On the other hand, um, Brecht's great adage, probably his greatest adage, was the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I, you know, you can have the most magnificent ideas for theater, but if they don't work, yes. and work means communicate with an audience, not necessarily, you know, the vast numbers of them. But you can tell if a piece of theatre is working, and yeah. and if it is, that's the one of the wonderful things about about the medium. And under your auspices, some of the greatest plays in twentieth uh, century drama were introduced. Uh, with Tom Stoppard, David Hare, uh, who else? Uh... Well, I would I would number. Um, the greatest uh, American play of this century, um, Angels in America. Yes. And it, see, it seemed at the time, and it seems even more so now, a, quite a severe indictment of certainly New York theater that the first production of the Angels in America plays took place at the National Theatre of Great Britain rather than on Broadway or in the public theatre or in the Lincoln Centre theatre. Um, it, it's, I wouldn't say it's shocking, but it is, um, it, it, it's sad that a, a writer as great as that was overlooked until yes his plays were uh, uh, acknowledged hugely successful for audiences in, in London. Did you feel at the time that you were taking a risk, that this was an act of courage? Um, uh, no, I didn't. You know, I, I really didn't. And I, I'm, you know, the, when I stopped then, I'm thinking, well, there's an answer to that, that kind of, um, if you say, yes, I took a risk, so that, that you say it displays courage. I didn't, I just thought they were terrific. And yeah. I read them, you know, I was, I did a production of Richard the, the Third mm -hmm. um, with Ian McKellen. I loved um, it. it. I saw it in Washington. Amazing. Um, it was, well, incidentally, that's the one that Harold Bloom, the late Harold Bloom, who, in my view, got almost everything wrong about Shakespeare. I couldn't agree said, more. I should, be, I should be assassinated for doing that production. 
he said in print, I should be assassinated. Um, anyway, um, no, I didn't think I was being courageous. I, uh, what I was about to tell you was I was going, supposed to go to Prague, where the production of Richard III was playing in Prague. I woke up and there's this eerie silence and I thought something's happened, looked out of the window. There were two feet of snow. It hardly ever happens, you know, once every 10 years in, in London. And there were no flights out of London at all. So I was forced, I couldn't go into the theater. I had a pile of plays like that. I picked up a play uh, that was that thick that had been sent to me by um, my friend Gordon Davison, who ran the yeah. Mark Taper yeah. Yeah. Um, Forum in Los Angeles. He said, I think you'll be interested in this. I saw a workshop in San Francisco. This was Tony Kushner's Angels in America. How about that? By page three of its opening scene, which was Roy Cohn, legal advisor to Donald Trump, um, legal mentor to Donald Trump, Roy Cohn on the phone. It was about a 10 minute speech, completely brilliant, yeah. very funny, very pungent satire and right on the money. And I read this play and that morning I thought, well, we have to do this play. And uh, I rang, um, well, my only disappointment was that I knew I wouldn't be able to direct it because I was already committed to things. So I called um, Tony and said, would he accept Declan Donlan as a director? And Declan did the most beautiful production of the play and, um, and it was thrilling. And, you know, I did warn the board of the theater. I said, we are doing this play um, and, and I always decide, made the decisions and then explained to the board. Mm -hmm. I didn't submit my um, plays, my portfolio to the board for their consideration because they said to me and I said to them, look, you employ me to choose the plays. If I get it wrong, you're perfectly uh, um, right, uh, obliged to get rid of me and get somebody else who chooses the right plays, but I can't decide by committee. There is no committee. Uh, I decide, and I said, this play will be problematic. It does include um, mimed scenes of, of, of male sex in Central Park. It is politically challenging. It is left-wing. It is about um, AIDS. It is about um, uh, religion, sex, death, politics. Um, but in my view, it's a work of genius. And they all went, oh, no, it, 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 well, all right. Um, terrified, yes. actually, they were. But but you know, they, they were they were a wonderful board, and and we were vindicated. Um, if if it had been a disaster, I I wouldn't have been fired, but I it would have sort of blown my it would have blown my cover, as it were, because I could no longer have said you've got to trust me, uh, and that I would have invited them to fire me. So. Now, was Margaret Thatcher still prime minister at that time? Uh, she was, was prime minister, in fact, during the whole, no, during most of my time. Um, I was in Paris, 92. She must have top, been toppled, 92. I remember that. Um, again, I was on tour with, um, again, with, with King Lear and, uh, King Lear, Deborah Warner's production of King Lear and my production of Richard III, we were playing at the Odeon in Paris. And on the way in from the airport, the taxi driver was saying, so um, Margaret Thatcher is, is fallen. And uh, he said, um, 
Uh, et puis uh, Jean Majeur. And I had and, and Jean Majeur, qui est Jean Majeur? And Jean Majeur, well, uh, John Major. And yeah. I barely knew who John Major and this taxi driver already knew that John Major was going to be prime minister. Anyway, I got to the theater and um, the French um, news got onto me and said, would I come on the news, speak in French about the, 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 the downfall of Margaret Thatcher? And I, there was a moment I thought, yeah, I will. and then I thought, this is crazy. My French just isn't good enough. And I'll look like some idiot uh, Englishman um, and won't do, uh, do justice to the subject. So yes, 92. Um, so a Tory government, um, however, John Major um, loved coming to the, the National Theatre and did come a lot. Um, but it wasn't a favorable time for the arts that the, the, the years that I was at the National Theatre. There were, um, I think seven different ministers who, uh, who were responsible for the arts during my time. Mm -hmm. um, none of them, uh, I think out, out of that seven, only one had been to the National Theatre before. So um, it, was, it was uphill and, you know, it's not as bad as, as the, you know, the, your National Endowment for the arts, but um, you have for all your arts organizations yes. have some or had in the past very very loyal sponsors and your government has right. always been generous with with tax concessions for giving to the arts to to, to charities whereas our government it doesn't encourage uh, do a lot to encourage giving to the arts yes but did you have any political interference? Did you did you feel at any point that uh, decisions you were making could endanger the the theater? Um, well, when I was appointed, um, in fact, the so the the week that I was um, I became director of the National Theater, a film of mine about the Falklands War called Tumbledown was shown and this had been this was a film which had been discussed in parliament the the army um had tried to stop the film being made there had been a lot of lobbying of the bbc eventually the film was shown it was controversial but very successful so i was thought to be in government um i was thought to be a raging um uh, left winger and they appointed a chairman chairperson for the national theater with the specific brief of they said sorting out the pinkos at the national theater mm -hmm. they made a huge mistake because they appointed mary soames who was the daughter churchill winston churchill's youngest daughter mm -hmm. now the first time i met Mary, who to meet her was was to fall in love with her. She was the most wonderful, warm hearted, intelligent person. And she said to me, you've got to help me. I want to do this job, but I know nothing about the theater. Um, and I said, um, well, let's agree to trust each other. You'll help me. Um, in the, the way only you can, and I'll help you. And we had the most wonderful five, five or six years um, with her chairing the board of the National Theatre. And she loved it. She completely went native. She loved everything about the theatre. She loved going round the theatre. She had an office in the theatre. She would go round all the departments uh, and she knew the names of countless people yeah. at the National Theatre and she became a leader of um, the National Theatre so she she completely defused the political opposition Wonderful. and she would explicitly say but you know the 
the theatre is not a medium to um, to present polemic. You present ideas and you, you challenge the existing ideas or you endorse the existing ideas, but um, it mustn't be regarded as in any sense uh, an arm of, of government. So she was, it couldn't have been a better choice um, to their, I think, infinite regret that um, they had appointed somebody who, and she became a very, very close friend. And uh, I admired her, I miss her terribly. And um, she had the most wonderful farewell, her memorial service in Westminster Abbey was absolutely heartbreakingly beautiful. And um, she had asked me, she left um, funeral wishes or memorial service wishes and wanted me to read the last speech of David Hare's play, Racing Demon. And she'd yeah. always adored the play and adored that speech. And so I read it out in, in Westminster Abbey in her memory. How lovely, how lovely. Were you already making uh, feature films by this point or did that come later? Um, I started, the first feature film I made was in 1982. Mm -hmm. And it was a film called The Plowman's Lunch, which was yes. very impactful. Um, and then I didn't make a feature film until I left the National Theatre. And the first feature film I made, um, I mean, I'd done a lot of TV films in the interim, but first feature film I made when I left the National Theatre was Iris. Oh. Um, so- What an amazing film. Um, thank you, thank you. It was, uh, it was wonderful to make, um, a course with, Judy, but um, with Jim Broadbent yes. and also um, Hugh Bonneville, yes. uh, who's yes. become very, very famous, right. and Kate Winslet, who was already a bit famous. Yes. So uh, uh, um, what a great cast and how lucky I was. And did you come up with the entire concept of having younger and older and... Um, did you, did you wrote, uh, do the script for it as well as? I wrote the script with a writer called Charles Wood, who oh. very, very distinguished oh. um, playwright and screenwriter. And we wrote it together. Um, and it was a, it was sort of the, the birth of um, Zoom or FaceTime, but um, we would call on the phone, but um, we were both, quite new to um, uh, computers, to laptops. Uh -huh. And so we would, we would correspond through emails um, all day long, exchanging ideas. Uh, how about this line here, this line here? And then Charles would say, I'd like to have a go at this scene. And I'd say, well, I'll have a go at this scene. And then we'd put them together and it was, um, I guess uh, probably Charles's, I was sort of polishing Charles's work, um, but sometimes some of the ideas, um, originally, actually we started off, we wrote the characters, both of them old, and thought that the old actors should play their younger selves. Um, and the then producer um, said, that's never gonna work. <laughs> so we, that's when we, we decided to make them, uh, to have two sets. But what of course, neither of us knew, and I didn't know when I was shooting it, how it was going to go together. Yes. Um, and you know, Kate and Judy, are, their warmth is, similar, but they're not physically very alike. Oh. Um, although Hugh and Jim Broadbent are probably more uh, yes. closer physically. And what was the next film after that one? Um, the next film, I think was a film called 
stage beauty. Yes. Right. Um, uh, and um, which with Claire Danes and Billy Crudup. Um, and it was, that was about the end of um, men playing women in the theater and, uh -huh. and uh, Charles in the, the, in the restoration, allowing women on the right. stage. And um, I loved the film and many people did, but uh, critics said, why are they making a film? Why are they doing Shakespeare in Love again? Oh. And I thought, well, yes, it does have Shakespeare in it. Um, and it is a love story, but um, so it never quite took off. And um, Claire at that stage was not the star that she is now because she hadn't yet oh. done Homeland. But it was it was fun to do. And then then I did um, Notes on a Scandal. Yes. Um, which with uh, Kate Blanchett and, and Judy Dench and, um, and Bill Nye. Uh -huh. And um, that was wonderful because, and, and as Judy would say, what was great was that it, it, for her, playing an unsympathetic part, um, because so often she is sort of cast as a living saint. Yes. Um, because, you know, she's just incredibly generous and right. sweet and good-hearted person. But um, she loved playing this really quite unpleasant and remorselessly un unpleasant woman. Yes. Um, and she was brilliant at it. And I liked the fact that, that the film was about two women, neither of whom was desperately likable. And oh. you were, um, I, I don't, I'm not crazy about the obligation of movies to, you know, the likability or yeah. as studios say, the rootability. Yes. They say, you've got to be rooting for the characters. Yes. And I think you can, root for characters without loving them. Um, and you root for characters because you're curious about them and because yeah. their fate is, is, is surprising or because they're absolutely more like the people, more like ourselves. You know? Yes, that's right. Ridiculously flawed. Yes. You know, your most recent film, the Children Act. Um, Jen and I thought that was an absolutely brilliant film. And you worked you. with Ian McEwen on that. And, and I did. Can you say a little bit about how that one came about? Um, I had known Ian since 1978. When I was, um, when I started to work in television, doing the, this strand of drama called Play for Today, I got in touch with a guy, I'd read his book of short stories, Ian McEwen, and it turned out that he lived round the corner from me in South London. So we became friends. Then I asked him if he would write a film for, um, for the, 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 the drama series. He wrote a film called The Imitation Game. Um, yes, it was on a similar subject to the, a film that was a few years ago with Benedict Cumberbatch, but this was 1980, we made this film. Um, the title, in fact, comes from Alan Turing, yes. who is the, the godfather of, of computing. Um, it's, uh, and he made a film about the, the, called The Imitation Game. Uh, that was the first film I directed. And Harriet Walter played this woman who wanted to be, it was set during the Second World War. She wanted to participate in the war and constantly find, found that doors were closed on her because of uh, her gender. And it was a film about feminism, if you like, uh, not exactly before its time, but it, it was about um, the position of, of women. So that was the first time I collaborated with Ian. 
Then we made a film in the 80s about Thatcherism called The Plowman's Lunch. Mm -hmm. And then um, when Ian was writing The Children Act, he called me. He now lives quite near me in Gloucestershire. Mm -hmm. uh, he called me and said, I'm writing a novel that I think would make a good film. And th that was The Children Act. And we were lucky enough. I don't think we could have made it if we hadn't got Emma Thompson. Yes. to play it because she was, I think she's matchlessly brilliant and somehow is the, the character. Um, so that's, that's how that came about. Um, and it, it was very, very popular in France and Germany and Italy and it completely bombed in the States. I have, uh, we never have understood why. Just uh, made no sense to us. <laughs> well, yeah. um, I don't know. I just know that, you know, that whole thing of, you know, if it doesn't take off in the first weekend and um, it just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard and I keep getting um, very gratifying emails from people who say I've just caught up with the children act and how, how much I enjoyed it, very moving and, and uh, thought provoking. And maybe it'll just sort of dribble on for, you know, it's it's there, people can get hold of it. I'm, but I'm... actually the last, uh, the last, after that, um, I made King Lear with uh, Tony Hopkins. Of course, after, yes, um, yes. So, and, um, and with Emma Thompson. Yes. And you had done a King Lear earlier with uh, Ian Holm, hadn't you? I had, I yeah. had. And Ian sadly died earlier this year. Right. Um, yes, I had, that was the last, almost the last show I did at the National Theatre in 97. And the year after, we, we made a film of the production for TV. Mm -hmm. You know, looking ahead, I'm uh, I'm wondering if uh, you know if, if we've had a uh, an opera based on Jerry Springer. Don't you suppose an opera based on Donald Trump would um, would be uh, a natural? Absolutely fantastic. Um, I can't believe that John Adams isn't currently or Philip Glass <laughs> is writing it at this moment. It would it would just be. Fantastic. I mean, uh, the great operatic subject, yes. I think. Yes. Um, and and somehow, uh, I think theatre can't quite do justice to the squalid um, idiocy and vulgarity of, of the man and, and the malign qualities. Whereas opera, I think music could deal with the, the sort of diabolical element. Well, I'm hoping that that will be one of the projects that uh, is awaiting you uh, once we get uh, out of jail and uh, are able to resume doing theater and um, film and, and all of the other things that you have blessed us with. Well, thank you so much, John. I, I, I dearly hope that we'll be talking in a year's time and We'll all have had the joy of a year's theater. Well, that's certainly our hope. And uh, let me thank you again for agreeing to have this conversation. It's been a real treat. And uh, I'm sure that everyone watching through the NAC at home site will love it. Thank you. It, it's been a great pleasure for me and a pleasure thank to you. see you again. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh,